Welcome to Dimensional Shift, where we explore and actively deprogram ourselves, seek the truth of reality through expanding our perceptions, and focus on full remembrance of our true selves. As we begin to connect to our true selves, we will also see the truth of this illusory reality and the way it controls us through our manipulated perceptions. As soon as we fully remember our true selves, we will also see the enemy for what it is and how to rebalance the system by freeing ourselves and assisting others to do the same, creating a domino effect into the evolution of human consciousness. Welcome back to Dimensional Shift. I know it's been a while since I've made a podcast. Things have been a little bit crazy. Been trying to keep up with myself quite literally and figure some stuff out. At the beginning of December, I went to Colombia in South America for another ayahuasca retreat and kind of had my sense of reality shaken up pretty deeply. So I've been trying to integrate some of that and accept some things about myself that I had been unwilling to recognize some shadow aspects and all of that. But I thought it would be fun for the end of the year and the beginning of the new year to review some of the, actually all of the past episodes that I've done and kind of update you on what I still think is truth and get rid of some paradigms and beliefs that were very much in the episodes that are no longer relevant or needed. So the first thing I want to say is that in a lot of the beginning episodes, I talked about star seeds and the galactics and things like that. The star seed thing is no longer a belief system I subscribe to in the way that people talk about it. I don't think that we're aliens incarnated here specifically, but I think that the star seed quote awakening has been helpful because If you boil it down to its essence, it is meant to help us remember that we are something more than just humans living human drudgery. And for me, that was the most important thing that I took away from it. Now, of course, you are free to believe anything you want to believe. If you believe in it very literally, that's fine too. But that is how my belief system has shifted and my paradigms have shifted over the past. It's been two and a half years since I was introduced to the starseed idea, and it's been about a year since I let it go. So we're going to start right from the beginning. Some people have asked me about episode one. Episode one was recorded and released, and I got a lot of pushback from different communities. It was supposed to be about those on the autistic spectrum or neurodivergent, and they didn't like hearing what I had to say. And while I still believe a lot of that was true, I just don't talk about it in general. And if somebody wants to have a specific conversation about what I think of neurodivergent people and their purpose, send me a message. We'll talk about it. It's really kind of fascinating, especially the overstimulation and the sensory overload aspects of it. So I did remove episode one, which is fine because it was really steeped in a lot of the galactic stuff, but the neurodivergent community has a very important role to play in this. And hopefully we can get rid of the identity politics someday and move into a greater understanding of that. Okay, moving on to episode two, strange PTSD, can trauma be from another life? So this episode started out with a story of having some kind of PTSD episode being triggered by getting hit in the face with a ball, which I had actually forgotten about until I listened to this episode. But I do remember very, very specifically when it happened. And I had one other sort of episode like that before that of being startled by a loud noise that triggered something I had to go to the bathroom and I was sobbing and it was pretty intense, but I don't have any actual trauma in my life that would be triggered by things like that, which is why this was really interesting to me. One point that I made in this episode was talking about other aspects of us in the multiverse experiencing something that affects us here now through entanglement. And this is really interesting because sometimes we do have these bad moods or We feel angry or sad for no reason. And it's possible that some aspect of us is going through something somewhere 
And because we are intrinsically linked to them, we're experiencing a lot of emotions that we don't understand at the moment. This ties in directly to how the collective consciousness and unconsciousness affects us as well. We are fractals of the collective consciousness. And so what happens in the collective, if you want to think of it, happens in the mind of God, also travels down into us in the micro. The Akashic field is pretty misunderstood in the way that people like to think of accessing their past lives and all of this through the Akashic library, which is sort of possible if you know how to maneuver the Akashic field and can find your specific information. But the Akashic field is all of it. It's every life ever lived, every life that ever will live. It's the living library that's being stored in this space. And so if you have a certain resonance, let's say you are feeling very victimized for one reason or another, and you have a trigger, whether that trigger is something that you've ever experienced or not, that trigger can hit that resonance and create these remembrances, these feelings, these aspects of you that come up that don't make sense in the moment. If you do know how to go through the Akashic field properly, or for some reason you have sort of like pre-programmed yourself to experience your past lives at a certain moment, or the right resonance and trigger comes up, you can find your past life trauma and use it as a point of healing. This is something that's really, really powerful and this is sort of like taking inner child work to the next level. Inner child work heals what you've experienced in this lifetime as a child and the trauma in this lifetime. Past life work and Akashic work allows you to do the same thing, but in past lives. Sometimes just going back into this life to heal the trauma doesn't always work. For example, in this episode, I also talked about the witch wound. So in this life, I've never been persecuted for being a wise woman specifically. I have had to go back through several, several lifetimes trying to heal the trauma that has been done to me. It seems like there's just more and more layers. Even now, that's part of the shadow aspects that I'm trying to integrate and the trauma that I'm trying to work through. It's just like an onion. You just keep going deeper and deeper. The last thing I mentioned was empathic PTSD. And this is very much a thing. This is something that I was working through in my retreat in December. We carry so many burdens that aren't even ours. Our parents, siblings, ancestors, friends, collective identities. We carry so much trauma and pain that isn't even ours that we just need to recognize it and lay it down. I realized during my second night how much pain worry, fear, and burden of just my parents that I was carrying that wasn't doing me any good. And it's just, it's like a form of programming and it it's self-perpetuating, just keeps getting passed down from generation to generation. And this doesn't even have to be done through trauma, but it's done through the way that children accept the model beliefs of their parents. So for example, my dad has always had this need to prove himself and to earn love. And that's something that got imprinted on me at a very young age is that I had to earn love and it kind of just screws up your whole life, but it's, it's not your burden. You can lay it down. One other note I made here was about the collective identities. A good example of this would be like the Me Too movement. It's really important to have traumas recognized and the proper support given, but when you make it into an identity like that, when you band together over collective traumatic events, then you take on a part of their burden because you no longer can set a boundary between this is mine, this is yours, and energetically it gets all sorts of mixed up, and it can be really unhealthy. You need to be careful about what your empathic abilities are accepting unconsciously or subconsciously. Moving on to episode three, Relative Reality Causes Conflict and What We Can Do About It. These titles are so terrible. I was using some kind of title creator back in the day, and yeah, they're just a little bit strange. Back when I wanted to be really important or something like that. Now I just talk. Okay, so Relative Reality. 
I talked about the self-centric worldview and how this this is kind of imposed upon us, but it's also sort of part of the whole setup. This goes into the idea of duality and separation and it has a lot to do with our perspectives of reality. And one thing I wanted to add on this episode is the idea of absolute reality. So I talked about subjective reality or relative reality, but I hadn't yet delved into the realm of absolute reality. A lot of people are really unfamiliar with the idea of absolute reality, but it, it's a really important concept to bring into your world because without absolute reality, there is no truth. And this is truth with a capital T. This is not subjective truth. This is not what I think to be true or what I believe to be true. This is the actual truth. So if we had two eyewitnesses and a video camera, the two eyewitnesses may give different stories, but the video camera knows the absolute truth and can, of course, tell us what actually happened. The problem then becomes the interpretation of the video camera, of course, and that goes back into eyewitness accounts. But that's the interesting part is we have to be able to step outside of the relative reality, the reality that we want, the reality that we think there is, and see absolute reality. And you can't do this without deprogramming your mind very, very, very heavily. The mind is always going to be subjective because the mind is self-centric. That's why when we begin to let go of the mind and the ego, we find ourselves to be other-centric. An important point here is that you can't argue experiences. If you tell somebody their experience is wrong or invalid, you are gaslighting them. And if you tell yourself that your experience was wrong or it didn't happen, you are gaslighting yourself. <laughs> People don't think very often that you gaslight yourself, but you will. Your mind will gaslight you. That didn't actually happen. You are not actually what you think you are. That's something that was really huge my last retreat as I had a lot of a lot of layers of who I actually am come on and since I got home it's like no that's not actually true something is lying to me that doesn't make sense and you just have to keep putting your mind back in its crib and telling it it's okay you'll be okay <laughs> you're not going to you're not going to break it'll be all right we actually had this experience no it doesn't make sense but it's going to be okay so that's where I am <laughs> So if you invalidate someone else's experience, if you gaslight them, you are actually in the wrong. Invalidating somebody else's experience is a limitation. It's a limitation that you're accepting for yourself. It's a limitation that you're imposing upon them. Instead of telling someone they're wrong, ask them for their perspective because you can learn so much by staying open to the possibility that everybody has something to teach you. And so if they share their experience with you, maybe in a few weeks, you'll be having the same experience. It's just a matter of staying open and refusing limitations. This goes back to the ideas of mutual respect and unconditional love. Unconditional love is such a difficult concept for people to grasp sometimes, but it's truly the simplest thing there is. Unconditional love is, I will not have expectations of you, and I will not allow you to have expectations of me. That's it. Literally, I love you no matter what you do. I love me no matter what I do, and you don't get to tell me otherwise. It is both freedom and love rolled into one. So when we love someone unconditionally, their experiences don't matter to us. Their experiences are for them. My experiences are for me. We can coexist peacefully if we allow ourselves to. So then we wonder, why do we need someone else's experiences to be the same as our own? Why is there such a push for that? Why do we need consensus reality? And it comes down to, we need the validation until we don't. And then once you realize that you don't need the validation, you move into unconditional love because their experience means absolutely nothing about you and your experience means absolutely nothing about them. There's no contest. It's just be and let be. Episode four, your emotional labor, a labor of love or emotional bondage. Ah, we can see this is when I discovered the Matrix and the Archons. Although I don't think I had yet fully awakened. I think this was still in December. I didn't have my full awakening until February. So 
the system and the beings who keep the status quo. They do this through collective consent and consensus reality. This, of course, ties directly into what we were saying the last episode, which is why do we need consensus reality? Why does everybody have to agree? Why do we need that validation? And it's because we've been told our whole lives that we do. Actually, we've been told for thousands of lives. It's literally programmed into our DNA that if we get kicked out of the tribe, we're likely to die. This idea is being manipulated and controlled. The fear has obviously just saturated this reality, but it doesn't have to be that way. The problem is the system is perpetuating the system, not just through the powers that be, but through consent, the collective consent. So yes, we can say, oh, the billionaires are running this country or they're running the world and they're so evil and all of this, but I'm going to continue to order my things on Amazon because it's easier or I'm going to continue to shop at Walmart because they're cheaper. And I know that a lot of us feel like we don't have a choice. And to some extent, that's correct. We have a certain amount of money. We may be struggling to make ends meet. But we are still buying into the idea that money is the system, money is the way that it is. We like our convenience, we like the ease of having things delivered to our house, we like being able to get things that you can't get without money. But we are going to be reaching a point at which we are going to have to actively reject money. This is something that has been tugging at me for a couple months now, but very, very heavily this past month, especially after getting back from Colombia, we are going to have to get to the point where we can be self-sufficient without money. The biggest, most difficult, confusing point is that all land is owned and we will require land. That's, that's one thing I can't get past. When we start creating these pockets, these sanctuaries or whatever it is that we'll call them, where we start gathering together in small communities. There will be land. I don't know those details yet, but we're going to have to remember how to grow our food, cook our food, live without things that we think we can't live without right now. But we can. They're very much superfluous things. And there's going to be a period where things will be hard as we remember how to do these things but eventually, once things settle down and go back into, not into the system, but into a wider community, certain luxuries will come back. Technologies, things like that will be able to be reinstated with more freedom. That's, that's the crux is the things we are, will have to give up for a while are going to be so we can maintain or regain freedom. And then if we're successful in the evolution of humanity, or however you want to put it, then those things will come back, but without all of the weird stuff that's involved right now. That was a total side note, but going back into the emotional labor. If we are telling ourselves the same stories over and over, and these stories have very strong emotions attached to them, we are giving up our life force energy to this story and to whatever beings are perpetuating the story and using it to feed on. The point I made in this episode was talking about the media. I don't think at this time I fully understood the depths of the entities that are attached to these, the things like the media and the stories and all of that. But the the point that I was making was to consume less media. The less fear and anxiety and despair you allow yourself to consume, the happier you will be and the less vital energy you'll be feeding to these entities. This also goes to the people you spend time with. Pick your friends wisely. We can't always pick our family, but you can control how much time you've spent around them. And if it is a family member that you can choose to spend time with or not, and they bring you down all the time, it may be better to consider either cutting them out of your life if they're very, very toxic and abusive and manipulative, or just absolutely minimize your time with them. This emotional energy powers the false reality. It's a war of the mind. It's a war of perception. So 
when I was in Colombia and I had turned off my phone, I had no media, I had only had people to talk to, there was spiritual focus. It's a totally, absolutely different reality when you're in a situation like that. And you can be cognizant of the rest of the world that's happening, but it doesn't affect you, it doesn't touch you. And not that that should be used to bypass, it goes to show how we create our reality. And if we are spending all of our time toiling in a job that we hate and giving all our energy to social media and all of that, then we're not creating the reality we actually want to create. And through consensus reality, we are perpetuating the illusion and the false reality. There's this idea in the prison planet theory that physical reality is the prison. And I disagree. I don't think physical reality is the prison. Yes, it's an inherent limitation, but the system, the systems and the system is the actual prison part of it. If you go into nature, and let's say you did what Alan Watts did, or Henry David Thoreau, you buy a little cottage, you live by yourself, you're totally self-sufficient and reliant, you have your creative pursuits and you do what you want, that's a totally different reality than the bondage and slavery that we're in right now. Absolutely, totally different. And that's what I experienced in Colombia. That can be available to any of us and all of us if we're willing to give up what we think we want right now in this reality, this system, and begin creating the actual reality that we want in this physical reality. But before we can do that, we have to find energetic and emotional sovereignty. And the only way back to sovereignty is through radical responsibility. Any power, any personal power that you want is directly correlational to the amount of personal responsibility you are willing to accept. This is taught in the occult circles. It has been taught for hundreds of years and until things got twisted of magic for money and selling your soul to this and that and the other. But the reason the medicine men and women and the, the shamans and the witches and everything were so powerful is because they were willing to accept responsibility for these things. It's almost like, in a weird way, it's like doctors and paramedics. If you're willing to take responsibility for someone else's life, you can save someone else's life. But most people aren't even willing to save their own lives at this point. And that's just because it's been a, a war of the mind and a war of perception. And people don't think they're worthy and people don't know how. They don't know how to save themselves anymore. But I'm telling you right now, it's through responsibility. If there's something in your life that you don't like, you have the power to change it if you are willing to take responsibility for it. Okay, that's all I have to say about that episode. I'm pretty sure I went in a totally different direction than the actual episode was, but it seemed to be important. Okay, episode five, the instantaneous speed of consciousness beats light any day. Sorry about the title. It's a mouthful. <laughs> I'm gonna just do a little bit on this one. I didn't have a lot of notes anyway. This is a really interesting idea these these ideas came so early. These understandings came so early before I really had any idea what I was actually saying that it's been really interesting looking back and going over them. But so the whole idea behind this one is that space time isn't real. It is part of the illusion. It's part of the cage on our mind. This is how telepathic communication is valid. I was talking about this in that episode. The problem is not everyone can receive, decode, or understand what's happening. So telepathy is very effective when both people know how to use telepathy, how to understand the messages that come in, all of that. But when you try and communicate telepathically with someone who has no experience with their psychic skills or anything of the kind, chances are they're not going to receive the message consciously. They're not going to be able to decode whatever it is that they receive, or if they they receive something, they may not even understand what's happening. They may just think it's a strange, intrusive thought, or who knows. I mentioned in here about channeling. I have mixed feelings on channeling still. If you're going to channel, only channel from your subconscious. I think that that's really, especially if you're new, that's that's really the safest place to channel from until you can start deciphering between beings. If you're really good about discerning what's you, what isn't, what's benevolent, what's not, then, you know, try it out. But don't take anything as face value. 
boil everything down to the essence. Everything has an essence that the symbols and the concepts are only pointing to. Don't take anything literally. Spirit world is not literal. The last notes here are kind of cryptic. I have holographic universe, psychic skills slash intuition, trance slash dream slash astral travel. So I guess what I'm talking about here <laughs> didn't do very good notes. The universe is holographic. I, I shared this quote in a subreddit yesterday that I would like to share that's really, really relevant and I keep going back to after all these years. This is from The Path of Energy by Dr. Cynthia Andrews, N.D. I keep coming back to this book, specifically this part, over and over because it's such a great explanation of the holographic universe. Most people, when they hear the holographic universe, they think of sort of this, uh, like a projection, a false projection. But this, to me, is more the essence of what the holographic universe actually is. A holographic consciousness a helpful construct for thinking about consciousness is the hologram. When holograms were discovered, they changed how scientists viewed both the universe and the capacity of our brain to process information. Through the study of holograms, consciousness can be seen as an all-pervasive and indivisible whole where each part has access to the information contained in the whole. Holograms have become quite common in our everyday world. We see holographic ID cards, advertisements, and knickknacks in every store. They've become so commonplace that we rarely think of what they really are and limit them to simply a three-dimensional photograph. However, that is the smallest part of what they have to offer. To make a holographic photograph, an object is illuminated with a laser beam. A laser beam differs from regular light in that it has a high level of coherence among the light photons. Photon coherence is the reason for a laser's brilliance. A second laser beam is bounced off the reflected light of the first laser beam, creating an interference pattern where the two beams intersect. The interference pattern is captured on film. The developed film looks to be a meaningless swirl of lines. When these meaningless swirls are illuminated with a third laser beam, a three-dimensional image of the original object appears. Have you ever looked at a magic eye picture? This is utilizing the principles of holography, with your brain creating the coherence of a three-dimensional picture. Its three-dimensional quality is not the most important aspect of the hologram. What is most remarkable is how information is contained in the picture. If a holographic picture of an image is cut in half, you don't have two halves of the picture as you would if you tore an ordinary photograph in half. Instead, each half contains the entire image. If the halves are divided again, each piece still contains a smaller but intact version of the original image. In fact, every part of a hologram contains all the information possessed by the whole. This concept has changed scientists' view of nature, consciousness, the universe, and the functioning of our brains. In holographic consciousness, the universe is not made up of separate individual eyes. Rather, each person is part of the same whole, experiencing his or her own individual awareness at different places within the whole. Every part of this awareness is important. Every type of experience is integral and holds valuable insight. There are no mistakes. From wherever you are right now in this moment, the job is to become fully awake, aware, and alive. This is how to maximize your contribution to the whole of consciousness. That has been really, really relevant to several people that I've been talking to the past few days. And it's just a really good reminder that we are fractals of the whole, and yet we also contain the ability to access the whole. It's a lot to wrap your head around. And even the part about the three laser beams and all of that is really, really symbolic of who we are here and how we're created. And if you want to know more about that, I would suggest reading Neville Goddard. He has a lot of good information put within a Christian paradigm of the Father, Mother, and Holy Son. That's really interesting. So I will stop there. That was episodes two through five. I will try to get another episode out of reviewing a few more episodes, probably within a few days to a week. Christmas is on Sunday, so we'll see. I'm going to try and get most of these out before the new year or right around the new year. And that way, after the new year, we can start a whole new chapter. If you found this episode helpful or insightful, please share it with a friend and leave a review or comment. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I host twice weekly open discussions on the podcast topic on our Discord server. If you'd like to join, 
head to dimensionalshifter.com forward slash discord. If you're on Reddit, come join the subreddit r forward slash dimensional shifters or send me a DM. My username is dimensional shifter. Keep deprogramming, keep connecting, keep listening to your intuition. This is it. This is what we've been searching for our whole lives, connection to our true selves.